Hi folks. It's been a while since I've made a video. I have been busy surviving the apocalypse, or at least one layer of the apocalypse, one unveiling. As many of you may know, I live in the Asheville area of Western North Carolina, and we just experienced massive flooding due to Hurricane Helene. I really want to share with you about new earth stewardship and what it means to be a steward of the new earth. And I'm going to use my story of the experience that I had here during the time of the storm and the aftermath to illustrate what I mean by new earth stewardship. So the earth is in a process of reformation. The body of the earth is actually undergoing physical changes that will result in changes to the landscape. And we're seeing that very clearly here in Western North Carolina after the storm. We belong to the earth. This privilege of incarnating into these bodies made of her stuff, this privilege is offered by Gaia, by the earth herself. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. We are the body of the earth. And so we are participants in this reformation. Many factors are contributing to this reformation. If we zoom way out, we can witness the cosmic influences, the, the cosmic clock of the astrological movements of the planets and our entire solar system spiraling through the universe. All of that is influencing the bands of frequency that we move through within the universe, within the galaxy. Um, all of that contributes to the experience that we're having. The unprocessed emotional content of humanity is a contributing factor to the heat that is building within the body of the earth that is moving us towards this transformation. And all the beings on the planet are involved, engaged in this process, right? And so there are some people that are really doing their work and doing lots of shadow work and metabolizing their emotions with great self-responsibility. And there are other beings on the planet who are enforcing their agendas of domination and control. So those are contributing factors as well. And of course, there's the commonly understood factor of fossil fuel emissions and really um, industry creates so much pollution on this planet. So that's impacting the environment as well. Um, but it is not wise to ignore all of these other elements that are at play. This is a multifactorial event that is unfolding on the planet. So the first aspect of new earth stewardship that I want to highlight is just being aware that change is happening. Change is happening. Change is here. The body of the earth is in a process of reformation. Since the flood in Asheville, there have been like six other massive floods all over the planet and fires burning out west again. We should not be surprised. This is what is expected at this time on the planet. The second piece I want to highlight about new earth stewardship in addition to knowing and noticing that changes are coming and changes are here and that we will be navigating changes is knowing how to self-regulate. We must know how to regulate our own nervous systems, process our own emotions, and so we can become pillars within our communities and beacons of grounded stability and light when these events occur. So in addition to having self-awareness and skills for self-regulation, it's also very helpful to not have any addictions. If you are addicted to tobacco or coffee or alcohol or kratom or cannabis, and you don't have access to the substance that you are relying on to regulate yourself, you will not be a pillar of stability and light. You will be a mess. So I cannot recommend strongly enough that you eliminate these harmful, habitual, addictive habits and patterns from your life so that you are ready and available, free, a free agent, ready to move in the world without needing to have your pacifier with you. 
Now, from within this place of stability and clarity that you have cultivated within your own system, you have the power to do energy work and magic. So I'll just tell you the story of the morning of the storm. Most people know the storm hit in the wee hours of Friday, September 27th. It was probably like 4, 5, 6 a.m. Um, it was probably around 4 when the wind woke me up. Now, there are these enormous old oak trees right across the street from my house in the yard of my neighbor. My neighbor's house is a stone house. It was, it's one of the oldest houses in the neighborhood. So it was one of the original houses in this neighborhood before it was developed. And the trees are, the street is named after the trees. They are enormous, gorgeous old oak trees. And if any of them fell in the direction of my house, um, my house would suffer. So when the wind woke me up, I immediately started doing energy work with the trees and was like inviting them to stay standing and definitely doing like protection work around my house and around her house. My neighbor who's 90 lives in the stone house. I didn't want any trees falling on her either. So I was working directly with the trees and the wind and the houses to maintain safety and stability in the neighborhood. I'll come back to the trees in a moment, but I did end up falling back to sleep. And when I woke up, the electricity was out. And I, so I knew, I knew this was a thing, right? Like I hadn't really been tracking the severity of the storm. No one was, no one was really prepared for the cataclysmic level of this event. Um, but I could just, I just knew I was like, oh, here we are. This is a thing. The electricity's out. That was a whole lot of wind. I am going to stay in bed and infuse my whole being with love. So there are these moments, these choice point, crux moments where we get to choose love or fear. Those are the choices, love or fear. And it would be so easy to go into fear in this type of circumstance, but I just chose love. And I laid in bed, infusing my whole being with love. I fell back asleep. I woke up feeling deeply present and rested and resourced. And from that place, I moved out into the world to go see what I could discover. And um, it wasn't much. What I discovered was roads were blocked, stores were closed, and cell service was down, in addition to electricity and internet all over the place. So no traffic lights were working, um, roads were covered with water, and there were definitely trees down in the neighborhood. And my neighborhood actually fared exceptionally well compared to some areas of Asheville. But when I came back from my exploration, one of the massive, giant old oak trees in my neighbor's yard had fallen while I was gone, I missed the show. But here's the thing, it was a freaking miracle, it fell exactly between her garage and her house and didn't damage anything. There are so many stories like this emerging from this situation here. So many miracles, so many near misses and so much magic. So definitely utilizing your skills from a well-regulated nervous system to um, work with the elements and the land and the people and the structures to maintain a field of love and beauty is recommended. Okay, so all of that is like the inner territory, the groundwork, the inner work for being able to show up and, and be present in a situation like this. It is also incredibly important that you be prepared in the outer realms. So this means knowing the weaknesses of your area. So we know here in the Asheville area that our municipal water system is delicate and easily compromised. So being prepared here includes filling up the bathtub with water and having jugs of drinking water on hand. Now, I typically drink spring water anyway. I take all of my glass jugs. I go fill them up at a spring. That's what I drink. I just so happened to be at the end of my spring water cycle when the storm hit, so I didn't have a lot of spring water on hand, which was very unfortunate, but I did fill containers with tap water ahead of time. Another weakness in this area that we know from historical events is gasoline. 
So I happened to have three quarters of a tank of gas in my car. And so I didn't require going to a gas station for a couple of weeks. However, the folks that didn't have gasoline in their cars were lined up for hours and there was cash only limits, like $25. So you could wait in line at the gas station for four hours and pay $25 for gas if you had cash. So definitely have cash on hand, have a plan for extra fuel and have a plan for the resources that you know are going to become scarce specific to your area if something like this were to happen. Now, because my neighborhood wasn't especially hard hit, I was blessed to receive electricity back after only three days. So I had three days here without electricity and then like 10 days without internet and I don't know, a few weeks without running water. And now the water's running, but it's still not potable. It's highly chlorinated. It's not going through the treatment plant. Um, so I'm still using spring water for almost everything. And my emergency plan was to cook on fire. And that's what I did. So I have a little fire pit in my backyard. I have a tripod grill that sits right over it. And so I was able to have warm cooked food and hot tea. And I used thermoses to like, I would make a fire at night. I would make dinner. And then I would put the leftovers in a thermos. And then I would make tea. And I would put that in a thermos. And so then in the morning, I could have hot tea without having to make another fire. That is a great tip to use thermoses to store food and drinks hot so you don't have to refrigerate it and you don't have to heat up again later. I know lots of folks that were cooking on propane camp stoves and propane grills. That's a great strategy. If you already have those things, make sure you have an extra can or two of propane around because that's another resource that's gonna go fast. Lots of folks were using generators. If you have a generator, you need to have fuel on hand to use it. I also learned about gasoline that it really starts degrading after a couple of months. So if you have gas cans that you store fuel in, you need to be cycling through it, right? So you would want to put it in your car every once in a while and refill it rather than just letting it sit for months and months and months because eventually it can cause damage to an engine if it's too far degraded. You'll also want to have enough food on hand to last however long that you think it might be necessary, like at least a week. You want to have at least a week's worth of food in your house for all of the people that are there um, and food that doesn't necessarily require refrigeration. Okay, so you want to be prepared. You want to be prepared on the inner levels and externally with extra gear, water, extra fuel, supplies. And you want to know how to be efficient with what you have. This is really key to success in this type of survival situation. And, you know, if you go camping or if you have done homesteading activities, like you're going to have a sense of what I'm talking about. But if you don't do those things or you haven't done those things, like this is a skill set that you really want to build. Okay, for example, let's talk about food some more. I love food, super into food. So my freezer and fridge are generally pretty full. And um, one of the misses for me was that I didn't put all of the ice packs that I had in the freezer before the electricity went out. Also key to note is that a full refrigerator and freezer, as long as there's room for air to circulate behind everything, behind the shelves, you don't want to shove things up against the back. So you want there to be um, air, cold air circulating around the back and sides, but when they're full, they have, they're holding more cold thermal mass. So they require less electricity to keep what is in there cold because everything's already cold, right? It's like a cooler, right? When you have all the frozen stuff in the cooler, it stays cold longer. Well, when there's no ele electricity, this is exactly how your freezer acts, right? It acts like a cooler. So filling the empty space in your freezer with ice packs is one strategy I would suggest. Then if your electricity is out for a few days, you know everything in the freezer is at least staying cold. So don't open the freezer. So you want to work on whatever is in the fridge first. So you're eating out of the fridge, um, opening it as little as possible. So it stays cold in there for as long as possible. And here it might be useful to know that any vegetable with a stem, like a celery stalk or a broccoli or a lettuce, or any herbs, like anything with a stem, any greens that have a stem like kale, all of those will do very well in a glass of water on the counter with a plastic bag over them. So it's sort of like putting your veggies in a vase, um, but then covering it with plastic. So they don't actually need to be cold 
if they're getting water and the moisture is being retained within a plastic bag. So that's a really handy strategy for not having electricity. Cultured and fermented foods don't actually need to be refrigerated. They, they might get more fermented or more cultured by staying out of the fridge. Um, so those foods are things that if you have on hand, you can stretch those out to the end and then you'll want to eat the things that spoil faster first. You may already know that if your eggs have never been washed, they don't need to be in the refrigerator. But another egg storage method is called water glassing. So if you have a bunch of eggs in the fridge and the fridge isn't cold anymore, you can put the eggs in a container, a glass container, and cover them with water. And that will help keep preserve them for longer. They really shouldn't go bad for months. So at the end of the third day of no electricity, I was tracking that the food in the freezer was thawing or thawed and it was still cold in there, um, but that, you know, by the next day I was going to have to start making moves. So my plan, which I did not have to enact, but it kind of would have been cool to try it out, was to can all the meat in my freezer in canning jars in a pressure canner over the fire. What an adventure. So I have all those things on hand. I have canning jars and I have a pressure canner. I've never canned over a fire and it would definitely be a high maintenance situation. Um, and I expected to spend like the entire next day working on that project. Now I'm no expert canner, but I know enough to know that if I put raw meat in a jar with a little salt and cover it with the vegetable broth that was also thawing in my freezer and then pressure canned it, at pressure, which is 15 PSI, where the little weight is rattling back and forth on top of the pressure canner for 90 minutes, you're good. That's good. 90 minutes cooks the meat, it's canned, it's sealed, it's safe, and then it does not need to be refrigerated. So I was sort of looking forward to doing that and then my electricity came back on. Hallelujah. I mean, I was so surprised. I was expecting to be without electricity for weeks. Um, but it was only three days in my neighborhood. So that was a blessing. I didn't end up having to can over the fire, but I would have. And yeah, I just let everything in the freezer refreeze. Seems totally fine. I've been eating that stuff since and it's not damaged. So that's a good strategy. And things like cheese and butter will last a long time without refrigeration. Um, and obviously root vegetables will last without refrigeration. So eat the things that will spoil first soonest and then move into the next phase of foods and then save canned things and dried things for um, after you've already dealt with food that might spoil. Another area of efficiency I can share about is water conservation, water use conservation. Now I should reveal here that I did grow up for many years without electricity and running water. I grew up in the woods without electricity and running water. So I have this is like built into me to have the capacity to like be super efficient. Water is heavy. I don't know how much water you've carried, but it is heavy. And when you have to carry it in, haul it in, you want to learn how to be efficient with it really fast. Wow. Oh, and I need to pause right here and talk about water sourcing. Like know where the water is. I know that everywhere is not as blessed as we are here to have springs coming out of the mountains, um, but know where the creeks are in your neighborhood, especially in the days following the flood, all of the creeks and drainage ditches were running with a lot of water. So people in all the neighborhoods could take their buckets and their containers down to the creeks and fill them up for flush water. And that was key. That was really important. There was definitely like a little squeeze time, like after the creeks and the drainage ditches started drying up and the water hadn't been restored yet, where people were having to figure out how to bring more water in um, to be able to flush. So know where the water is in your neighborhood. Know where the water sources are. And um, the magical nature sanctuary where I get to walk every day in the woods, five minutes from my house, has a spring. So I've been cultivating my relationship with that land for the last three years and cultivating my relationship with that water and inviting it and encouraging it to be running all the time because in the past it has been ephemeral. It's dried up sometimes in the summer, but not this past summer. So, um, so I know where the water is and that water, I feel good about drinking right out of the mountain. So I could access water that I could drink and water that I could bring home to wash with about five minutes from my house. Now, in the circumstance where my car wouldn't work, it would be like an hour and a half adventure every day to be able to bring five gallons of water home. 
when you're working with only five gallons of water a day, you need to know how to be efficient with it. It's also super important to have some type of water filtration that doesn't rely on electricity. So I have a gravity fed water filter. Actually, you can see it in the background there that um, stainless steel container is a water filter, gravity fed water filter. And there are like backpacking pump filters where you put one end of a tube in the water source and then you pump with your hands and it pumps it into a vessel. So it just pumps through the filter and into a vessel. Those are pretty easy to get and um, reasonable to work with for drinking water. So I'm going to talk about dishes for a minute and I probably should just make you a video about this, but I'll just start here. So um, a mixing bowl that is, you know, kind of shallow, a shallow metal mixing bowl is the best vessel for heating up. Um, you can put a half a gallon of water in like a nice sized shallow mixing bowl and heat, heat it up on the stove or, you know, if you have, um, if you're only heating things up on propane grills or the fire, like use a kettle to heat up some water. You really don't need a ton. Um, that shape requires the least amount of water for the most surface area. And you can fit like a whole dinner plate in that size and shape of a vessel. So warm up the water, put some dish soap in it, wash all the dishes with the hot soapy water, pile the dishes up in another vessel um, or in the other side of the sink or next to the bowl in the sink. And then I have like a plastic pitcher um, that I can then pour fresh water over the soapy dishes to rinse them. Now, that can become expensive if you're just pouring, you know, fresh water over every single dish. So I like a method where I'm like rinsing, like kind of like one layer of soap off and getting everything sort of once rinsed and getting most of the soap off with like a small amount of water. So you can do that by pouring some in a cup and swishing it and then dumping it in the next thing and swirling it and putting it on the other thing and sort of catching it with the other dishes to keep using it. And then um, all of that water can be caught in a vessel in another bowl or container. And that, if you're desperate, can become the wash water for the next batch of dishes that you'll warm up and put soap in. Um, and then once you've done like an initial rinse on the batch of dishes, then you'll go through again with whatever fresh clean water you have access to and do like I said before, where you like rinse one cup and then pour it in the next cup and rinse and then you can rinse the outside of the first cup with that one. And my aim with this is to get the freshest, cleanest water on the inside of the vessels where the food or beverages rest and the outside of the bowl or the backside of the plate or like the handle of the cup, they can kind of get rinsed with that rinse water, right? So that the outside doesn't need to be quite as fresh and clean as the inside. And then if you catch all of that water in a vessel, then you have, you know, another half gallon of water ready for the next batch of dishes to heat up and put soap in. And that is how you can literally do like an entire batch of dishes, like an entire dinner. I literally hosted a dinner party here for like you know, 15 or 20 people and did all the dishes by hand with like a gallon and a half of water. Now let's talk about bathing for a minute because the water is still highly chlorinated and only just recently has become less discolored. Like really when the water first started running, it was pretty brown and it was kind of like yellowish. It's getting clearer and clearer. Um, but it's still, it's like pool level chlorinated and I don't really want to bathe in that. So I've continued to bathe in spring water that I heat up on the stove. I also have taken showers at friends' houses who have wells a couple times, which is very nice. Um, and I'm like really enjoying bathing in spring water because it's alive and it feels enlivening. And to be in contact with natural water is one of my strategies for cultivating my relationship with the earth and with Gaia. So that actually feels really good to me. So I just heat up a pot of water on the stove, I bring it to the bathroom, um, if I've let it get too hot, then I'll have like a cold bucket also and I can mix. And then um, I just sit in my bathtub and pour water over me and then put soap on and scrub and, and rinse myself. And I can feel like really clean and refreshed again with about a gallon of water, a gallon and a half of water. So other tips are to use really dirty water to wash really dirty things before they go into the wash water and to use whatever kind of extra water is around to save it and water your plants with it if you have plants. 
that's how to be efficient with water in an apocalyptic situation. So know how to manage your energy, know how to self-regulate, don't have any addictions, um, do magic and energy work, be prepared, have your gear lined up, know where your water comes from, know how to be efficient with resources. And from that foundation, from that stable foundation, really only took me a few days to like get all my systems in place and like feel like, okay, like I know where the water's coming from, I'm cooking on the fire, oh, the electricity's back on bonus. And then to like find stability with my routines. And then I became available for what else needs to happen here. And for me, the first line, the first priority was actually to do more energy work. So I gathered with a number of people in different groups in different places um, on different days. And we did group energy work to sort of read what was going on and witness emergence and fuel and seed the field with frequencies of love. So yes, the earth is on an evolutionary trajectory. She chooses love. We can go with her. When we join forces with her, we reinforce and strengthen that choice and our choice to like be on the train. So, you know, chaos breeds opportunity, like the timeline potentials multiply in times of chaos and tumult. And we recognized that we were like in a very open field, an open portal, um, a very fertile place, a fertile opportunity for seeding frequencies of love and unification and embodiment and like, what are we really doing here? So I had a really beautiful experience of working with multiple groups of people, um, seeding the field and, and, and really metabolizing shadow that had been sort of um, squeezed out by this experience. You know, there were a lot of people dying. So there's also a lot of like souls moving through the field and a lot of those people died really suddenly and that can create shock in the system of the soul right so they're like they don't even quite know they're dead and they don't kind of know where to go so there's there's a lot of like supporting the souls to move through and to move on and like realize what's happening and like get the support that they needed on the other side and really beautiful things unfolding in the matrix of the city of Asheville and sort of bringing divine union codes online. And one of my friends, Sarah Poet, she talks about earth grids. That which, that's what she calls the templates that are awakening and arising, arising and amplifying within the field of the earth. And I ended up doing a live with her one day. Um, maybe I'll link that below so you can find that if you're interested. Anyway, that's what New Earth stewardship looks like inside of a cataclysmic event. I mean, in order to steward the new earth, you have to actually survive the reformations. So, <sighs> now, if you're still listening and you're still here and you feel like you would benefit from some support to cultivate your capacity to be a new earth steward, to really be able to show up, to stay grounded, to self-regulate, to be a pillar of light in these wild unfolding circumstances of, of the unknown. Um, I encourage you, please take advantage of my free new paradigm leadership 10 day boot camp. And I walk you through day by day, a number of areas that will support you to cultivate the capacity that I'm naming here and even to find your local water supply and to know how to self-regulate and so many layers of what I experienced over the course of the flood time here in Asheville speaks directly to what I have laid out in the New Paradigm Leadership 10-Day Boot Camp. So definitely sign up for that. Don't get discouraged. If it feels hard the first time through, just do it again. You don't have to do every single thing in one day, right? It's a, it's a tall order, um, but it's layers. And you may find that you have some of the layers handled and some of them need some refinement. Um, so don't be hard on yourself. Just go through it. Do 10 days. If there's still pieces missing, do it again. Do it three times. Do it four times. 
super helpful to create a stable foundation for yourself to be able to show up and endure through whatever may come your way. Okay, beauty, thank you so much for your time, energy, and attention. Many blessings. I'll see you next time.